what do you get when you bring together 60 natural scientists, engineers, and gender experts in a series of international collaborative workshops? You get something radically new. That's the goal of gendered innovation. The operative question is, how do we harness the creative power of gender analysis to discover new things? But first, let's have a little bit of fun. It's important to emphasize that in my lifetime, the situation for intellectual women has improved dramatically. And we can see this in a series of draw a scientist tests over the past 30 years. Think of this as a science makeover. This is the before picture from the 1980s, and in it you see that 48% of the students were sure that the scientist had facial hair. 25% imagined a scientist with a pocket protector. And what's of interest to us is that only 8% of the students drew women. Now, fast forward to 2008, the last time that the test was repeated, and here's Harry. Harry is so excited, he's about to burst out of his lab and note the Einstein hair. Now, a full 33% of the students drew women, a great improvement over 30 years earlier, but we still see stereotypes. Note the close cultural association between women and nature. Today, we're going to explore gendered innovations, a large collaborative project involving the European Commission, the US National Science Foundation, and Stanford University. Your job in the next few minutes is to figure out what gendered innovations are, how they apply to your work, and to begin to see how gendered innovations stimulate creativity, gender equality, and make research more responsive to society. It's a tall order, but very exciting. Let's step back for a moment and to put gendered innovations into a context and look at the three strategic approaches that governments and, and universities have taken to issues about women and science over the past few decades. The first focuses on the participation of women in science, or as I like to say, fix the number of women. I don't know any institution today that is not trying to hire more women scientists and engineers. So why is it that a place like Stanford University, women constitute only 21% of the senior faculty? We've been working on this now for a long time. And I what I want you to understand is that we will not be successful in recruiting and retaining more women if we focus on women alone. We need to take the next step, and that is transform institutions or fix the institutions. Here, the goal of governments and universities is to reduce unconscious gender bias. Today, we all want to do the right thing. We want to be fair, but sometimes we just don't understand how our unconscious attitudes and behaviors influence hiring and promotion. An arresting study was published last fall by the US academies, and it showed that both men and women professors prefer to hire a man over a woman with the same academic record. The study sent the same dossier to 126 biologists, chemists, and physicists. Half the applicants were named John, and half were named Jennifer. The papers were exactly the same, only the names differed. Both men and women professors scored John higher on competence, giving him four points out of seven, and they gave Jennifer only 3.3 points. They were also happy to to offer John a higher starting salary. The good news is that today we know a lot about transforming institutions. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You may have heard of the University of Michigan's STRIDE program that helped its schools of science and engineers overcome unconscious gender bias in the hiring process and 
in the process then increased the proportion of women hired by 30% each year over nine years, this is quite a great accomplishment. This brings us to our third approach, gendered innovations or fix the knowledge. This is the newest and hottest area and the most important for the future of science and engineering. And now I want you to listen carefully. Data show that gender bias built into society in general and into research institutions in particular create unconscious gender bias in science and technology. For example, 10 drugs were recently withdrawn from the US market because of life-threatening health effects, and eight of those posed greater threats in women. When we develop these drugs, they cost billions of dollars, and when they fail, they cause death and human suffering. We can't afford to get it wrong. It's crucially important to understand gender bias, but we can't stop there. We need to turn it around. We need to get it right in the first place. We need to harness the creative power of gender analysis to see new things. And let me give you three quick examples of how this is done. These are some of the aha moments from our gendered innovation workshops. Urban planners, my first example comes from public transportation. Urban planners collect data to understand how people use trains, subways, and bus systems. Here, the gendered innovation is to reconceptualize how data are collected. Traditionally, urban planners collect information about trips in eight categories, including employment, education, shopping, leisure, and the like. Men and women who travel simply for employment tend to travel directly from home to work and back again. But none of these traditional trip categories capture caring work, caring for children, the elderly, or households. Those who travel for employment plus caring work have different travel patterns. They tend to travel from home to the daycare to work. On the way home, they may go food shopping, go to the dry cleaners, back to the daycare, and home again. Conceptualizing the mobility of care as a category of analysis creates more efficient public transportation systems, reducing costs and enhancing the quality of life. My second example comes from computer science, natural language processing, and specifically machine translation. And I start with a little story. A couple of years ago, I was in Madrid and interviewed by some Spanish newspapers. As soon as I got home, I zoomed the articles through Google Translate. And I was shocked that I was referred to repeatedly as he. Londa Schiebinger, he says, he wrote, he thought. Google Translate has a male default. How can such a cool company as Google make such a fundamental error? Google Translate defaults to the masculine pronoun because he said is more commonly found on the web than she said. And this is the interesting part. We know from Ngram, another Google product, that the ratio of the masculine to feminine pronoun has fallen dramatically over the past 40 years from a peak of 4 to 1 in the 60s to 2 to 1 since the 2000s. This parallels exactly the women's movement and the massive governmental funding to increase the number of women that I discussed earlier. With one algorithm, Google wiped out 40 years of revolution in language, and they didn't mean to. It's unconscious gender bias. So the fix? Last July, the Gendered Innovations Project held a workshop where we invited two experts in natural language processing, one from Google and one from Stanford. They listened for about 20 minutes, they got it, and they said, we can fix it. It turns out that fixing this rather simply annoying problem will lead to innovation in translation overall. It has to do with uh, understanding context. So once they got it, 
we got or we will be getting an innovation. My final example takes us to sub-Saharan Africa and water infrastructure. Nearly one billion people worldwide lack access to clean water. In sub-Saharan Africa, women and girls spend 40 billion hours a year carrying water. The gendered innovation here is tapping into this local knowledge. Because carrying water is women's work, many women have detailed knowledge of soils and the water they yield, knowledge that is vital to civil engineers when placing wells and water taps. Now, I'm going to do a check. When I said civil engineer, did you imagine a man? So here, this woman in Ghana is mapping well sites. Such community participation vastly improves water services. And here we have a win-win situation. When girls aren't carrying water, they tend to go to school. And when they're educated, this can potentially break the cycle of poverty. There are many gendered innovations we could discuss. Through the Gendered Innovation Project, we've developed 24 specific examples treating different subfields of science and engineering, from the design of video games, to stem cell research, to the genetics of sex determination, and osteoporosis research in men, to name just a few. Now, what can you do? How do we mainstream this type of analysis in the day-to-day -day work of science? First, we need to train you, the, we need to bring you, the current generation of researchers, up to speed in gender analysis. And we can do this in several ways. How many of you set policy in granting agencies? Agencies can ask applicants to explain how sex and gender is relevant to their proposed research. The European Commission is making this an important part of Horizon 2020, which is their next framework, uh, funding framework. How many of you serve on hiring and promotion committees? Committees can evaluate researchers and educators on their success in implementing gendered innovations as one factor among many. How many of you sit on the editorial boards of peer-reviewed journals? Editors can require sophisticated sex and gender analysis when selecting papers for publication. A number of journals do this. Nature has a limited policy. And finally, how many of you teach? Professors from elementary school to high school to graduate school can integrate the results of gendered innovation in the curriculum. It's crucial that we train the next generation. Innovation is what makes the world tick. As I hope I've begun to show, Gendered innovation sparks creativity by offering new perspectives, posing new questions, and opening new areas to research. We can't afford to ignore such opportunities. Thank you.